Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Data Unchained. I'm Molly Presley, and I'm the host of the show. So what is this podcast all about? The paradigm for data access has changed. In today's decentralized world, getting data to remote workers, to distributed applications, and artificial intelligence engines in the cloud is a challenge. Data Unchained digs into the challenges and the solutions to make data an asset as a globally accessible resource. As we look at who our guest is today, he is familiar, I think, to a lot of you. Dave Van Hoy is president of ASG, which is... um, a technology integration group, but really an expert in really bringing new technologies into customers as they're looking to solve the latest challenges in the industry. Um, Dave, would you first just, I want to say hello and thank you for joining the podcast. And would you also talk a little bit about what ASG does? Well, thanks, Molly. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I really appreciate you having me on. Advanced Systems Group, or ASG, as most people know it, is a company really dedicated to bringing technology and services to creatives to allow them to do their best work. And sometimes that's technology itself. Sometimes it's services to support that. And today, you know, that encompasses physical system design and integration. It includes VAR services, uh, including large storage systems, uh, managed services where we provide uh, anything from backfill personnel to operating entire facilities for our clients, and now uh, cloud services, and in particular, live produ- production in cloud, which is definitely a new and, and difficult thing. When you look at the types of challenges that your customers um, are trying to solve, you mentioned creatives. Is that primarily um, folks who are doing video production for Hollywood? Is it corporate video or kind of what does that mean to you when you think of the creative market today? You know, for us, we've been very lucky. We've been able to grow across multiple geographies and uh, lines of business. And so today, creatives for us are anybody who's making almost any kind of content. In Northern California, that does mean primarily tech customers and corporations who are creating assets and video in support of their main lines of business, but it's not their main business to be making video. Whereas in Los Angeles, our main clients are the large content producers, people like Warner Brothers and Sony Pictures and uh, Fox. And, uh, and then in Los Angeles, our main clients are down the lines of business of the distribution and the rights owners people like NFL films or A&E or Showtime. And so all of these have different kinds of technology needs to support the people who are creating and modifying and distributing their content. Is there a common thread of the types of challenges these organizations are looking to solve, or is it pretty unique to the different industries? You know, in some places, there's a high degree of alignment. In other places, they're very unique. And So that's part of our job is to find where those alignments are, which tools work where. One thing I can say today that is very aligned is there is a great diaspora of talent. People are working more places in all kinds of roles. And so the data silo, data distribution problem is probably greater than it has ever been. And I think that is pretty uniform across all three of our primary areas. And when you say that the data silo or distribution problem is an issue, is it about getting data to remote workforces or is it trying to do production in the cloud? What is it that's causing the challenge about these data silos? It's my favorite answer to an or question. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) The, the, it, it really applies a lot of places, you know, in, it, the most simple place that it applies is the poor graphics artist who all they want to know is where is the video they can get, they can, where they can grab a frame to as a plate for a background. And, you know, but it, it's all over. It's in every workflow, whether it's a traditional broadcaster, whether it's something where, where we're running a real-time service in cloud, it all involves media, media as data. And so the problem is having the right data at the right place at the right time. And 
that, you know, as our ability to do that in wider geographies across more platforms grows, which it is, the problem only gets worse. When you think about the types of um, challenges customers run into as they're moving towards the cloud, you mentioned that ASG, and I probably should call you Advanced Systems Group, but like you say, we're used to our shorthand for you guys. Um, as you've started to look at moving into the cloud, is it organizations that are running in multiple places? They have some content at the edge somewhere, they have data centers in the cloud, or is it that they're trying to do a full-on move to production in the cloud? So in the case of uh, our cloud live production group, that is 100% in the cloud it, in terms of it is, you know, it's your, your contribution is always on the edge because it involves real things, humans. But the, and, and your end, end is always at the, de- at the edge because probably it's humans viewing it. But in between, we're at a place now where, you know, 100% of the workflows in, be- in the middle want to run in public cloud, both for cost and agility reasons. Interesting. So when you think about those two metrics, cost and agility, is it the cost savings because they don't have to spin up and manage their own data centers? Or is it that they have much larger compute farms? What is it that helps them to save money? Or is it more about they can make more money because they can produce faster? I think there's different ways to look at that. Again, it's a little bit of yes. Uh, the, uh, I kind of figured. You know, but <laughs> you know, and, and it really depends a lot. If it's a, what we, we in the industry, we tend to call a greenfield build, meaning somebody who has starting from scratch, the advantage of doing the cloud side is huge because now I don't have to build server farms. I don't have to build physical machine rooms. I don't have the power. I don't have the air conditioning. Whereas if it's a facility that already has an investment and sunk cost around those, then then the, the, the view of that is more incremental because you've already got a sunk capital cost. And so we see a high degree of variation amongst the clients in terms of how they approach this. A company who wants to get started running production in the cloud, are they doing it because um, the barrier to entry is maybe faster? Can they move quicker because they're in the cloud? Is that ever, do you see small organizations just say, hey, let's not even bother building up a data center. Let's just get started in the cloud. There's just definitely two things that I think are very relevant to that. One is when I say agile, that's really what I meant. The ability to spin up something in cloud is certainly not instant because you still have to design the system. You have to flush it out, but you're not waiting on physical gear. You're not physically wiring things up, you know? Uh, and so the time to execute is generally significantly lower. And in this time right now where we have supply, all kinds of supply chain problems everywhere, um, you know, it really helps with that. And then, and then the other part is it's a giant um, lowering of the barrier to entry. You know, I don't need to, to necessarily spend a million and a half dollars on, on an, enough equipment to run a multicam production. Uh, in, you know, I, I'm now, you know, spreading that cost over multiple years by running the tools as a, as a subscription or a SaaS or consumption and using the hyperscalers, physical compute and data center instead of having to build my own. So, whereas, you know, it might've, if it took me a million and a half dollars just to build the control room, now that's, a, and, it, and my in, initiation for the first year of production, doing it using cloud-based tools is, $200,000, my barrier to entry is a lot lower. Do you find that most organizations have the skill set to run the IT part of all of this up in the cloud, or is that an area that they struggle? It varies highly. Um, you know, as always, you know, video when moving over long distances and via the internet is, is challenging. And so some organizations are well suited to do it. Um, some are find it very daunting. And, you know, we come in and we, you know, fill that gap from whatever their skill level is to success. So, you know, if we're working with somebody like a three-letter broadcaster and, you know, they have been moving 
large amounts of video and, re- and audio in real time for a long time. And so they're pretty much experts in it. Whereas when we go to work at, say, a Silicon Valley uh, tech company that where you know they likely have maybe a couple of video production people and then they've got this giant IT staff, they, look, they tend to look at the bandwidth and the latency required and uh, are like, yeah, we're not doing this. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, you know, so it, it can range wildly. As you think about as a company, you, you work with a lot of end users as well as, as a reseller and different technologies. How do you go about selecting which technologies you recommend to your customers? You know, it's a tremendous responsibility. You know, I think people often don't appreciate how much work the VARs and system integrators put into making sure that they represent uh, products and services that actually work. It's, you know, it's, you're, you know, my reputation is based on how well that thing does. And that's really in what we do. That is our main value to our clients is to be that bridge and to be the people who backfill the technology needs, both from a human point of view and from a technology point of view that they may not have in their organization. And we take that really seriously. So it involves a large amount of research, of testing, proof of concepts, training. I mean, just the the training requirements for each of our engineers and our field engineers is remarkable, the amount of this spend, both in terms of hard spend and time spent. You know, it's getting a certification in AWS or GCP is a, the, at a system design engineer level is about a three week adventure full time. And, you know, if you look at that from an organizational cost point of view and that these are employees that are highly comped, um, it is not a small investment. No, definitely not. And they're not out working with clients, raising, making money either at that point. So it, it's, it is a big investment. Um, and as you think about the data movement and data storage challenges that we kind of talked about at first, how are you helping your customers solve those? When you're thinking about the new technologies you're architecting in and kind of how you're thinking about bringing together the data or the content to the people doing production, how are you approaching that? You know, it always starts with a, you know, a conversation that's effectively the beginning of a needs analysis, you know? What is it you're trying to do? What is it you need your creatives to do? You know, what are their barriers today? You know, what are what slows them down or prevents them from doing it all together? And those are, you know, that's that's where every conversation starts. And then and then we look to see, you know, what resources do we need to bring forward to take kind of those high level goals and dig down and learn what the real pain points are and what are the, the, the things they're really trying to achieve. And then tie that back to what kinds of technologies can help them achieve that. And so when you think about the idea of um, bringing more talent in that can help create production, you think about the remote workforce, are there new technologies or new pain points that you've had to figure out how to address to enable that remote workforce? I mean, it happened during COVID, certainly. But now I think just people are not living next to their studios or to their headquarters anymore. It is true. You know, and in truth, you know, we've started down this path long before COVID hit. Um, You know, there has been a desire to untether the creatives more for a long time. You know, if you just think about it from a kind of a practical point of view, you know, there's a really talented colorist. I want to color my commercial, but this guy has chosen to live in Omaha, you know, and I'm in Los Angeles. So that means if I want to use this guy, I have to fly him to LA, pay for his time to do that, pay for his travel expense, pay for his time to actually do the work, pay for his time to travel back. And and the, and the time loss of all that. So if I can create a workflow where he can do any large percentage, it doesn't even have to be 100% of the work, 
sitting in his, you know, pajamas in, in his living room in Omaha, it's a gain for that person. And it's a gain for me because that's less expense. And, it, and it's a, also a gain from the point of view of time to delivery. And this really, that's just one example. But one of the great examples that was really brought forward by the work during the pandemic was, you know, people obviously couldn't go and sit in control rooms and do the kinds of things they normally did for live production. So the ask was, can we take all of those people and have them do their jobs from their house? And we're not talking about people running, you know, video editing or color or graphics. We're talking people running real time stuff, you know, switchers, audio mixers. And it was just necessary to produce any content. And so, it, you know, it's amazing what compromises you can live with when it's, oh, let's do this or nothing. And uh, but but then what it really turned around to was becoming kind of a permanent enabler of, hey, you know, I'm doing a show down in Austin this week. I'd love to have this guy who's my favorite technical director run the switcher, but he's booked back to back in, you know, Chicago and Omaha and there's no time to fly to Austin, do the show, and then get to the next one. Now I can book this person to do this event from wherever they are. And it's a pretty remarkable gain in talent you know, acquisition. Yeah, it's kind of mind-boggling, honestly, when you think about the complexity of these productions. And, you know, uh, that old joke about, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. You know, the pandemic was really good for technology in that way because it all it forced all of us to get way outside our comfort zones and do things we would never have found acceptable. And uh, and, and that circled around now to things that are, have become practices. So where do you see gaps in technology in these areas, kind of, of where we've evolved to in these practices? I, I think one of the biggest hotspots there is the concept of uh, the complexity of file management for creatives, especially when working uh, remote uh, or in in places where the assets aren't stored locally. It is, you know, beyond just the speed issues and the latency issues and all the things that, you know, you think of the internet that's so lovely, not good at, um, you know, is it, I'm looking for this file. Is it, sitting on-prem on system in LA? Is it in the other system in LA? Is it in the cloud? Is it on the system in Vancouver, BC? All I want is this file, you know, and you, you watch some poor guy who's trying to work, do the work with this, spend half an hour just looking for the asset, you know, like, or worse yet, the asset's there and they don't have permission to, to, to access it. And it's just such an amazing time suck. Uh, you know, and so things that I, th I think that is the really painful part of these enabled remote workflows. Who do you think should solve that? I mean, there's asset managers, there's workflow managers, there's storage companies. Where do you see the solution? Or is it setting some standards around how it all works? I could give you the creative answer, which is anybody who can make it work. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, in, in as a long time, you know, troubleshooter and, and, and problem solver, you know, the best case scenario is to be able to solve it with technology that makes it transparent to the user. Because in truth, I'm the person sitting there and I'm, you know, my job is to add captions to this video. What I really want is I want to be able to go to my desktop search on search in my 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 finder or whatever i'm using find the file open the file and just work and i don't want to spend time guessing which which folder it's in i don't want to spend time guessing which bucket it's in you know and uh and so that's really the ultimate goal as we look to kind of tie up this episode but also think about what we would like to leave people with who listen to this show um where do you recommend people go to learn more? I mean, obviously ASG has fantastic expertise and both on how to get a project started as well as how to implement the project. 
But where else do you recommend that people go to learn to operate effectively in this kind of new work environment? So I will selfishly say one of the best things you can do is find a good VAR or system integrator who knows a lot of the tools who can help you sort your way through to which things you need to learn. Well, and it sounds a little corny, but it's true. VAR means value add. And that's why, right? Value added resellers are not just selling technology. They understand all the components. Yeah. And there are people who, who do it every day, you know, and who look for solutions to these problems. And it's, it's their job to know what the answers are. And, and that's a good place to start. But beyond that, there's a tremendous amount of data available today and, and knowledge that you can access, you know, from vendor web pages. Um, I, you know, I think today some of the most cogent stuff is being done by uh, the HPA and SIMPTI, as well as um, Movie Labs. You know, Movie Labs, I think, is way out in front of some of this stuff because it is the life, it, lifeblood. 2030 project that they're doing. Yeah. You know, it's, I think those are great resources, whether I'm in a corporate situation or whether I'm uh, working a, a job at NBC. You know, I think these are, these are organizations that are nonprofits that are dedicated to your peers and helping you all learn from each other. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I think that it, having the opportunity to talk with you as you've come through not just the pandemic, but this massive surge in video production. I think it's great for people to get a chance to hear how you're looking at the market, um, how you're looking at technology evolve. One of the things I found super interesting when I was reading a just a research report recently was that it actually is corporate America who's creating the majority of video these days. And you don't think about it that way. You know, you think it's Netflix and the studios and Disney and folks like that. But corporate America is creating such an enormous amount of content. And I think often tasking traditional IT people with how to do that. And that, that's hard. You know, that's hard for a traditional IT person to do. Um, and the types of expertise your company brings in is so valuable. And one of, one of the skills we built is working with those corporate IT people to help relieve the pain. Uh, it's, you know, it's because it's just not their expertise. You know, uh, I, I often explain to them that we're, you know, we're, we are IT people who understand media. And in truth, that's what a lot of our job is. You know, we came from audio, we came from video, we came from, you know, all of that. But, but today, all media is data. And you have to be really good at high speed data to do it. And it's, and, you know, a lot of companies like Microsoft and Apple and many others have, have actually made what is remarkably high speed data easy. You know, you plug in the FireWire drive, you don't even think about it. And, uh, you know, or USB drive or whatever it is. And, you know, you don't think about the fact that that interconnect is faster than all of the data, data pipes combined on the first Avid. You know, and, you know, and, uh, and that used a bunch of connectors that were two inch wide and there were a lot of them. And, uh, and so in that way, we're tremendously enabled. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really poignant for me is, you know, we're, we're just a few weeks from our company being 25 years old and it's given me a chance to, you know, every so often kind of look, you know, at kind of just the evolution across that time, because in the scope of technology, that's a long time. And, uh, and yet the workflows and the value judgments of the creatives are very much the same. They want to make engaging product. They want to make good looking product. They want to make product that sounds good. And that has never changed. And, you know, all we've done is given them better tools to do a better job and to do it faster. That's pretty great. And I know from other conversations I've had with you that the company has grown pretty spectacularly over that 25 years, which is something to be proud of. Um, but it's also a tribute to your company's capabilities. Um, so as we tie up, if the folks who are listening to this show would like to get in contact with you and the team that work with you, what's the best way to get to reach out or to engage with your organization? You know, our website is a great place. There's a lot of resources there. Um, and there's a great contact page, which believe it or not, we actually download the contacts every single day. Um, and real humans look at it. <laughs> and real humans look at it. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but beyond that, you know, I'm, 
I've been in this industry pretty much my whole life. Uh, people are welcome to contact me directly. And then I may not be your person that moment, but I will certainly get you to the right person. And, uh, and I'm always happy to do that. Always happy to meet a new, another person either doing or looking to do great work. Very cool. Hey, Dave, I know you're very busy. Thank you for taking the time to join the podcast today. And I wish you the best of luck in the next 25 years with ASG. Well, thank you, Molly. It's an honor to be here. It's a, you know, it, 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 you, I've worked with you many places. It's great to get to work with great people like you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com. Thank you.